Welcome to our 197th online gathering for faith leaders across the country. This regular gathering called Courageous Leadership is sponsored by ELCA's coaching ministry. I am Jason O'Neill. I use any and all pronouns, and I'm the operations manager for ELCA coaching and one of your facilitators today. In attunement with the truth and healing movement of the ELCA and moving toward right relationship with our indigenous siblings and neighbors, let us begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm gonna put a couple of links in the chat. So you have those. So bear with me while I do that. Jill is traveling today, so I'm handling all the things. <laughs> Ah, one more. All right, there we go. So we are gathered together from all parts of Turtle Island, also referred to as North America, and we are connected by technology, by faith, by a common sense of purpose, by the breath given us by the breath maker who has named and called us here, and by the very peace of Mother Earth, the land that each of us inhabits today. We understand the importance and necessity of, of acknowledging the land and the original indigenous peoples whose creation stories are rooted in these places and who have lived on and who still live on these lands throughout Turtle Island since time immemorial. We also understand that all land is indigenous land and we invite each of you to name in the chat the indigenous peoples or tribal nations who were the first to love, pray, grow, celebrate, cry, drum, and sing upon the lands and places where you are located now. <clears throat> we know that indigenous peoples are not historical subjects, but part of our communities, churches, schools, and leadership, and that they offer invaluable wisdom for how we exist today and into the future in relationship with Mother Earth, as well as our human and non-human neighbors. If you are indigenous, we invite you to name your people or tribal nation in the chat now so that we may see you more fully in this online space. So thank you to each of you. We understand the importance and necessity of acknowledging the land and its original indigenous peoples and doing so consistently whenever and wherever we might gather online and in person. Also, we understand this protocol is only a first step. And as we venture into the world, we must learn more, do more, and realize healing and justice for the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. So let us begin this work by entering into a place of peace and listening together. Through these gatherings, we have developed a covenant of how we enter and interact in this space. We are committed to creating a safer and braver space in these gatherings, where each of us are able to bring the truth of who we are and how we are doing. And with all of this said, we proclaim these conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. For our topic today, allow me to read a few sentences from the ELCA's webpage on civic engagement. Scripture reveals God's presence in all realms of life, including political life. This church understands government as a means through which God works to preserve creation and build a more peaceful and just social order. As people of God, we have been freed to love our neighbor, seek peace and justice, and care for God's creation. Faith should inform not only our participation, but also how we look at public issues and interpret what is happening in political life. <clears throat> our Christian faith compels us to attend to the world through the lens of our relationship to God and to one another. As a public church, we have a responsibility to step outside of our comfort zones and challenge ourselves to address issues that affect families, communities, and neighbors throughout the world. So we are honored to welcome the Reverend Amy Newman, Ruman, excuse me, <clears throat> Senior Director for Witness and Society for the ELCA. Amy, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our speaking space. Thank you, Jason. I also answer to Newman because it's used so often. Um, Hello friends, hello colleagues, uh, hello um, fellow disciples. Um, uh, it's really great to be here, especially uh, I was remarking as we were just gathering, we're, we're on the cusp of a very busy election season. And um, we know and we're hearing from Lutherans around the country uh, who are 
curious, who are concerned, who are um, want to be active uh, in all the all the different dimensions of what it means to be making some of the choices we have ahead. Um, to start us off, um, I want to use a prayer that um, uh, I prayed in a gathering last night that was also working on election equipping um, because I, I like so much how it takes our Lutheran um, uh, uh, support and recognition of public service as an important way that we serve God. Um, and that to be a, a politician, uh, to be a poll worker, to work on a campaign, to encourage people to vote, that's all part of our vocation. They're all callings. And so we hold them with a very high regard. Uh, and it's it's a good thing to remember at this time because, um, again, we know we're, we're perched or we're already in the middle of a season where there is a fair amount of um, vitriol and um, language not always befitting God's people. Um, this prayer is from the ELCA collection of worship resources in a national election year. Uh, and uh, we can share the link to that, which has um, off, oh, seats already there. Thank you, Karen. Um, so please pray with me. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Everlasting God, source of all liberty, before whom every earthly ruler must bow and bend the knee, we lay our nation before you as we prepare for an election. Breathe upon us your spirit of wisdom and discernment. Grant all who seek public office the mind of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for the freedom of the oppressed. Hold before us those who face uncertain futures or who have no voice in our political process. Uphold and safeguard poll workers and election officials in their work. Save us from the crushing weight of cynicism. Give us grace to speak courageously, but with love, without which our, no our words are noise and we are nothing. Gather us together under the cross, where in all of our difference we can stand as one people, redeemed in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Uh, the invitation today was to come and present on the ELCA Civic Engagement Guide. Um, but I hope in so in leading you through some of the pieces of it and the resources that are there, it can also be a springboard to some conversation and discernment about all the ways that we can engage as people of faith uh, before, during, and after an election. Um, all of those are, are, of course, very important. I'm just going to start my screen share. I'm, there it goes. And I think we're there. Are we there? I think we're there. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a resource that the ELSA Witness and Society team puts out uh, uh, or for election year resourcing for congregations and individuals. Um, um, both to provide, it, as it says, encouraging, empowering, and equipping, um, but also to give um, uh, reliable uh, advice and guidelines around what we can do as churches and congregations and or faith leaders uh, in an election year. It, it, it gets updated uh, every two years as we go into another election. And so um, you know, we hope to bring you always the, some of the, the freshest uh, insight or advice that there is. And again, we'll be sharing those links so that you can get to this guide yourself. But first, just wanna take a, a step back um, and dwell for a moment in the social teaching um, and what we understand as our, our social responsibility as, as Lutherans, as people of faith and society around an election. And so this is from our social message on government and civic engagement. And it reads, uh, actually, is there someone who's uh, bold enough to unmute and read? I can't see if you're putting hands up. I would be happy to. Awesome. Thank you. ELCA social teaching holds that all residents of the United States have a responsibility to make government function well, not to abandon our democracy, but to engage it in a spirit of robust civic duty. For Lutherans, this responsibility is lived out 
as a calling from God expressed in the discipleship described in our baptismal promises. It is based on our understanding of how God, gover how God governs human society. So imagine if all our churches would put this on their bulletin cover uh, at some point over the next couple weeks um, as, as a reminder of, of what it is that, that we believe and teach um, uh, in some of our conversations that we're having with uh, folks around the country who are interested in leading some kind of civic engagement work this election cycle. I'm really struck by how many um, feel like they don't even know how to bring it up in their congregation. Um, and that the, the hesitancy or the, the concern that it's going to immediately be divisive, even to talk about nonpartisan engagement. So I just want to hold this here as, you know, particularly beautiful piece um, of our social teaching and highlight a few of the words from it. Um, first, the teaching holds that all residents, it's not just all citizens. And so we, we recognize together that um, we're made up uh, in this nation as a community, we are citizens and those who are not citizens, um, and that we all have a stake in the decisions that get made uh, in this election and inviting participation into it. Uh, we actually heard last night from uh, uh, an initiative in Virginia for um, people who, uh, former felons who cannot vote of ways that they invited them into engagement um, even if they can't go to the polls, they can sit at a table. They can provide repre refreshments. There's ways for everyone to participate. So we have a responsibility to make government not just function. You know, here's we're raising the bar here. Uh, function well, um, and then I think particularly it's not to abandon our democracy, but to engage it in a spirit of robust civic duty. Um, I have a 22 year old daughter who I've been talking to about the election and she's uh, not entirely sure whether it's gonna yield anything that's meaningful for her life. Um, she's pretty disappointed in what she's seen uh, so far in her young life. Um, but that, that temptation to abandon and to walk away, we also know that there's huge consequences. And so um, uh, we're called to engage it uh, in robust civic duty. Um, and that we understand this as a calling from God. It's part of our vocation. It's embedded in our baptismal promises. Um, it's one strand of discipleship. And the more we can teach it, preach it, practice it, support one another uh, in it, which is part of the call of the Witness and Society team, um, we can do that. And that it comes out of this affirmation that God works through government, right? We know in our social teaching, it's not something alongside or different from um, how God works through the church. God works um, uh, through all human institutions and spheres, and we need to therefore treat that with the same level of response, uh, uh, expectation and, and responsibility. So um, today we're gonna talk together more about being Christians and churches in an election year. Um, but first I wanna back up and unpack the word civic engagement, because it's not something that necessarily comes up in your everyday language, although it certainly does in mine um, right now. Um, in the guide, when you do get your hands on it, it says civic engagement means working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities and developing the knowledge, skills, values, and motivation needed to make that difference. It means promoting the quality of life in a community both through political and non-political processes. So I'd invite you for those who uh, wanna uh, go to your chat, are there examples of civic engagement you've been involved in that you wanna share or things that you identify as civic engagement? Um, what are some examples that you can see? I cannot see the chat because <laughs> I'm projecting. Um, uh, Karen, if there's some that pop up that you can read, but what Let's would be see. some things that you think of as civic engagement that improves life for others, that helps shape your communities, that is moving out of our personal sphere into the public sphere, that contributes to democracy, um, that builds relationships, that chooses leaders, that makes sure the leaders are responsive. Mm -hmm. What are some of these things? Well, thanks for, for dropping some things in the chat. Here we have offering water to the community on ultra hot days available to all. Um, jury duty, that's... Uh... That's definitely an act of service too. 
Anyone else want to drop something in that chat? We'd be glad to share it. Well, we will move on, but in the civic engagement guide, oh, that slide is missing. Well, that's sad. Um, <laughs> in the civic engagement guide, there are some distinct examples of that. And so I, I just want to say for you, those of you who are going to be bringing this to a community or congregation, how do we talk about it? You don't necessarily start with talking about voting. If that is, uh, feels like a, it's a trigger or would immediately be contentious, we hope it certainly uh, wouldn't be. But that in addition to voting, we can uh, be involved in civic engagement through participation in the census every 10 years. We know how important that is for programs that serve um, communities in poverty uh, and more. You can go to town hall meetings. Uh, right now, I was uh, on a, a Zoom last night with people from Arizona, the hunger team from the Grand, um, Grand Canyon Synod, who are going to town hall meetings of their members of Congress to ask them questions about the farm bill. Um, and to tell them what's important to Lutherans in fighting hunger. So that's one way to be civically engaged. Um, we're civically engaged when we stand for public office ourselves. Um, when we, you know, throw our hat in the ring and run. And um, there are more Lutherans now. We're aware of more Lutherans in, in civic life than maybe we were a few weeks ago, um, as well as honoring that service uh, uh, as, as a vocation. So your advocacy for an issue, um, community organizing for social change, um, volunteering for a project, showing up at a protest or a march, all of that is civic engagement. And all of that we understand is part of God's work um, so that our governing structures can hear from, reflect, um, and, and align with when possible, the values that we bring from our, our church communities. So, when we wade into this area, though, in an election year, it's really important to know the law and to abide by the law. And here's where we often get a lot of questions. Um, so here's the language um, uh, straight from, from, from the IRS. Uh, Any participation by congregations in activities related to the electoral process must be, one, must be strictly nonpartisan and abide by IRS guidelines. So according to the IRS, um, all 501c3 organizations, churches, our ministries, community organizations, nonprofits are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective office. This sounds quite strict and forbidding and it's meant to um, uh, provide very clear yeah, boundaries uh, that 501c3 organizations are required to abide by in order to keep our tax exempt status. There also are implications for the role of rostered ministers. Um, and at the bottom of the sheet, that, that activities related to the electoral process are, these are important words, transparent, nonpartisan, and legal for abiding by this law. Uh, there is a separate guide from the ELCA for this um, that's called Guidance for Churches and Clergy Participating in the Electoral Process. Um, that is also, Karen, I'm sure Karen's gonna drop it into the chat uh, in a minute, um, but it's, it is important to know and digest this and see what can you do as uh, a church and what can't you do? What can you do as a rostered leader uh, or with a particular position in the congregation, what can you do as an individual when you take your, you know, professional hat off? Uh, and so knowing these laws and then making sure that these are interpreted, shared and interpreted in your congregation are, are very important. Um, if you have further questions about what you can do, um, you can always go synod lawyers. Uh, are a good resource for that and can provide guidance as well, uh, particularly to church groups. Now, last week I sat in adult Sunday school class um, that was discussing politics in the church and I was just a visitor. Um, and at one point in the conversation, the pastor paused and noted that people were using the word politics and partisan interchangeably. And in both cases, uh, they were used to describe behavior or tactics that were nasty, basically nasty, despicable, or destructive. 
<clears throat> um, so first, just a reminder um, to talk politics. Uh, talk about politics is to go back to the, the root origin of the word, the Greek polis, which means city. It's the place where we all gather. And so as used here, it's just about politics is about how we order our, our life together for the common good, how we govern ourselves uh, in the in the city or wherever it is that we may leave. <coughs> leave. Politics is then also how we negotiate um, how we are going to live together. Um, and so it's not in and of itself a dirty word, even though it often has come to be a stand in for the more um, focused word, which is uh, partisan. Um, so the word partisan, well, here it says related to or supported by a particular political party. Um, it can often mean blind adherence to a group or a party or a faction or a set of beliefs or a person. <clears throat> and that's where we see so much playing out in our society today. Likewise, um, uh, I, uh, defining nonpartisan, which is what we need, we can be partisans as individual, but as the church or as individuals representing the church, um, we, our behavior and our actions need to be nonpartisan, not endorsing a particular party or candidate or expressing any kind of allegiance to them. And we'll, we'll get into that a, a little bit more as we move on. <clears throat> and of course, in our advocacy work as a church, we strive to be bipartisan, um, which is relating to supporting um, both groups because they need to come together and create the compromises that passes laws and moves things forward, at least in a US context. Um, and our, our social message uh, acknowledges that a lot of people re, uh, object to the church being involved in politics, um, but that the church's role is not to take partisan stances, um, uh, but is to be part of those negotiations, aligning with neither party or any party, um, but helping to move the conversation forward. <clears throat> so again, you can go to the guide for all of this, but I just wanna unpack some of these uh, uh, activities that may be seen either that, that can be determined either partisan or not partisan. So what can we do as churches in an election year? And um, I'm having a little trouble with my voice. Could I have someone read this slide? I'd I would really appreciate it. Getting another cough drop. I can read it. Thank you. Um, so permissible public group, um, public church. Uh, so one, distributing nonpartisan voter guides, encouraging voting, deepening voter education through issue discussions, and inspiring other meaningful opportunities for civic participation. Number two, facilitating debates, hosting screenings or discussions of publicly broadcasted debates. Number three, facilitating equal opportunity speeches or bipartisan debates. This can be facilitated by representatives from campus groups with partisan affiliation. For example, have the president or representative of a campus student Republican organization and the president representative from a campus's student Democratic, or Democratic organization give speeches to raise voter awareness on relevant issues. Four, canvassing neighborhoods for participation in the election. Five, organizing get out the vote campaigns. Six, organizing voter registration drives and seven, organizing letters to local newspapers on the importance of civic engagement. Thank you so much. And these are just some examples. Are there, uh, is there anyone here who's done any of these in the past? Just raise your hand. <coughs> great, great, great. Um, the guide will go through in a, in a little more depth some of the ins and out of these. You know, but particularly this, um, anything that you do publicly that you're going to host, you need to make sure everyone contending for that position is there, that you are hearing from every side. The closer it gets to the election, the more important it is that, that you are as scrupulous as possible about all of this as in how it would be interpreted. Um, and so we'll, we'll, get, we'll flesh out some more examples of... Um, and resources for, for doing some of these things uh, in a minute. Likewise, 
there's a longer list <laughs> of things that you cannot do. Um, and I'll just run through these, these quickly. Um, so making contributions as a leader of a church or a church uh, towards a, a political candidate or party. Um, that's, that's just a no, no, uh, no one here would do it. Right. But allowing candidates to raise funds for their campaign in any way on their church's property, website, newsletter. So, you know, the whole property <laughs> needs to not have signs on it. Um, and I know sometimes that can happen without, uh, having been asked, but uh, that's something to be very important about, uh, very uh, attentive to no endorsement. Uh, number four, I don't know how the word got dropped off, but explicitly or implicitly endorsing a candidate. Please don't do that. More about signs. Um, and even being careful if you do a voter registration guide um, that you're not, uh, can't draw a direct line that you may be targeting a certain area to influence the vote. Um, you do want to target areas sometimes because it's around the church. That makes perfect sense or underserved populations uh, where there may not be get out the vote. Um, but I think you have to be very clear about where you're going and why, and simply be able to answer to that. Um, some other, the, the no-nos are things to be uh, careful about. Um, you know, no coordinating with, with parties or candidates on your get out the vote work. Um, um, I think number nine is important. Asking a candidate to pledge support for a religious denomination's position on an issue. So of course you can go and say, I'm a Lutheran, hunger is important to me, what are you gonna do uh, to advance the farm bill? That's perfectly fair game. But to say, will you support the ELCA's you know, public policy uh, stance on X, Y, or Z? Um, as well as then any publicity that you might do, uh, either supporting or opposing what a, what a candidate said. Um, and then just more about um, how you use your space, um, and distribution of materials. So there's more about this in the guide and in the um, uh, the public church document that I had previously mentioned. Just very briefly, this is a total different look of a slide, but it's from an organization called uh, Boulder Advocacy that I think is pretty helpful because it's got the red light, partisan political, yellow light on lobbying. There's the, if this was on lobbying, we could talk about all the lobbying ins and outs for, for faith organizations. We're not gonna um, go there today. You can do, we can do a lot as the church, uh, as a 501c3 organization um, in all of those green blocks. Um, uh, although we need to know the guidelines for them. Um, but so there, there's a lot we can do. There's some things that we can't and we need to know the difference. So in the voter guide, uh, a civic engagement guide, um, we have particular uh, tip sheets on, on the following topics. And so this may be something you want to turn to when you've downloaded it and to see would, would doing this this fall fit for your faith community. So again, first is, is the voter registration uh, information, how to register new voters, or really important, help people update um, their voter records. That can also often be a cause why someone is unable to successfully vote um, because they're up, their records, they moved, um, some information changed and they are unable to um, to do it on the spot. Um, the more we can do to help people know these things in advance. Uh, we had a guest on our call last night who talked about how they just used it with phones. Um, you know, people could scan, get right to the site, do it right there, make it very easy and keep their private information private uh, by doing it on their own device instead of um, uh, giving out that information. Um, so there are many ways churches can be involved in that. There's good guidance in the guide, as well as I'm sure there's wherever you are, there are local get out the vote organizations that, that are doing good work on that too. Um, just down to the candidate forums, some churches, um, host these successfully year after year. Again, look, follow the guidance in the guidebook. Again, make sure all candidates are invited. Um, there's, uh, tips for, um, you know, how to do the invitations, how much, what a timeline for planning might be. Um, um, but I think it's good to think about if you haven't done one before to partner up with someone who has, who's already thought out some of this, whether it's another uh, faith institution or perhaps League of Women Voters or other civic groups that, that hold these and to learn how to do it and then go into it uh, the next year. Um, 
there's pl voting pledges. Um, we're not currently running one this year, um, but some groups do. Um, or church. Um, again, we heard last night from an organization in Virginia doing what they're called 100 being 100 percent voter congregations. So that churches that signed up were making a pledge that they would get everyone in their congregation to vote. Um, sometimes using a pledge as well as lowering barriers and creating, um, you know, opportunities uh, to make sure people could could get to the polls. Um, however, that whatever that meant in their context. And then there are get out uh, the vote initiatives. Um, plenty, plenty of ideas again in in the voter um, and the civic engagement guide about how to do that either by going to where the people are and uh, getting out information or to do it digitally, to do it within your congregation, and then especially outside the congregation walls. Um, there are also tips for how do you do this in uh, communities where it's hard to get to people, um, where there's a lot of, of high rise apartment buildings, where there's a lot of affordable housing units, um, where there are people who don't have addresses. Um, we have a, a separate guidance for how do you register people and help them vote um, who are currently unhoused. Finally, and we're gonna to get to some small groups to talk about this and to talk about what next steps everyone here could consider taking. Um, sometimes the first step in some congregations isn't even this get out the vote stuff, but it's simply starting the conversation about being Christian and the importance of voting. Um, we have a new resource this year. Uh, it's called uh, it's an inter intergenerational conversation starter. Um, uh, you know, if if adults uh, don't want to wade into talking about uh, voting because um, it brings some discomfort, um, the kids in church, those who can't vote yet, uh, could ask uh, other members you know, questions, very simple questions. What was it like the first time you voted? What was that story? How did it make you feel? What did you learn? And how has your faith impacted your voting choices? And some people say, you know, I've never thought about that. I've separated these two things so much. Um, so th this conversation starter is, is one resource that's an easy on-ramp that could involve a kind of conversation maybe your community hasn't had yet. Um, another way uh, to get into that is through Bible studies. Um, and there are several currently available with, with more coming to, to, have, to center around scripture um, and to talk about how the scriptural witness, um, how our understanding of God and Christ and mercy and redemption um, and being called to community, how all of that is going to um, perhaps speak to people in a different way, uh, in, in a very faith-rooted way about the importance of helping making these choices uh, in our community. Um, I certainly wanna note, um, as, as the ELCA Votes resource says, um, voter suppression is still an issue. That's an understatement. Um, there's many places where uh, there's both, you know, active um, uh, suppression uh, or intimidation uh, that can happen. There's laws that have changed that make it harder to vote um, or that restrict where polling places are. Um, and so uh, there is this resource and other ways to have conversations to build awareness, you know, especially around uh, suppression of um, communities of color on tribal lands um, and people who have um, historically faced um, uh, stark uh, inequities in, in being able to have access to the vote. There's also just the conversations in our communities um, then. Um, we're certainly highly aware of all of the polarization in this country, how hard it is to te uh, speak. Um, the ELC has quite a few different resources, but um, one that that we've just shared on the advocacy blog is, um, is on addressing polarization and building cohesion um, with a whole list of resources uh, that uh, one may match uh, how you could hold a conversation and fit what your congregation may be, may be looking for. And just about finally, um, new this year, we have an election activator network. What is this? Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to become part of a, a group of energized ELCA and or curious ELCA Lutherans who want to be a resource in their community. Um, and so uh, when you sign up, uh, the first thing you have to do is sign a pledge that everything you do will be nonpartisan. Um, 
both in the group as well as what you would lead in the congregation because congregations need that assurance. Um, and then there's monthly conversations with sharing of resources, small group discussions, um, and helping hopefully people learn about what next step they could take in their own community, um, as well as occasional uh, you know, emails with, here's something new, have you tried this? Um, and this is uh, still, uh, there's a few more sessions before the election, you'd certainly be anyone here invited to be a part of it. I'm gonna stop talking now and see, is, is there, are there any immediate questions, comments, concerns? Um, something uncovered that you hope to hear about? And I can't see the chat, so someone's going to have to. I have not yeah. seen anyone drop a, a question in the chat or comment, but be or raise a hand, yeah. those. Or raise your hand, of course, yeah. Yeah, John Otto has raised his hand. Yeah, yes, I'm wondering how our advocacy office in Washington, D.C., and in some states fit the compliance with nonpartisanship. Because when I go to Olympia in Washington, uh, under the guidance of a uh, interreligious group that's he that has been headed by a Lutheran pastor, we do advocate for particular legislation. Uh, and it sounds like what you're saying is, is that that's a violation or is it not? No, that is not to, to speak to policy is not a violation. It's something that we can do, uh, you know, as as citizens, as um, people of faith, um, and to go and have our concerns uh, or our support or our opposition to particular legislation, where it gets um, trickier or where it gets uh, more confined is around election year engagement around candidates. You know, so policy. You know, policy may have, you know, partisan um, uh, aspects to it, but in the end, it's going to have to be, there's going to be, have to be some kind of bipartisan consensus in most places, not every place, uh, to get passed. And so just speaking to the policy is no problem. Um, it's speaking about candidates for office, especially closer and closer and closer it gets to an election, so that there not be any hint that you are, you know, providing public support favoritism, promotion of a particular candidate, which would therefore be partisan engagement. Is that helpful? I, you know, I have yet to hear of a congregation and I've seen many do it. I've seen it in, in black congregations and in some large conservative congregations where they invite a candidate to speak during the worship service. Uh, I, I haven't read of anyone being punished for that. Um, that does happen. Um, I would say that is not a good practice, uh, long term or even short term. Um, and right there is the whole question of enforcement. Um, and so there is there's abiding by the letter of the law. There's also the spirit of the law. And I think we also you have to think as a congregational leader. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's if I'm a pastor of a congregation, it's not my job to imprint. The, in the congregation, what I think the correct you know candidate for this office will be, people are going to come with their very different um, allegiances, experiences, preferences, um, and can our congregations be a, a place to hold that sometimes tense diversity uh, uh, in in ways that that are healthy and and even healing and different from the rest of our society. Um, so while yes, it does happen, does it is it in forced. Um, there certainly have been, I've I seen incidents of, of attempts to put faith communities back on the tax rolls um, for all sorts of different reasons, but including sometimes uh, for political activity. Yeah, good question. Okay. So in that case, I'd like to invite us into, um, should we say 10 minutes? It's a good Jason, I, he's in charge. Um, and uh, to share in some small groups, um, these questions, uh, uh, what's your experience been in, ele in election engagement where you are, whether that's yours or what you've observed in, in churches? Um, have you been part of a get out the vote initiative or would you like to? 
what's one step you could take this election season to um, uh, to move your, what is the question, to invite your church or community into more civic engagement? It can be a baby step. It can be a giant leap. Um, is there more information that you would like to have that the Witness and Society team could, could hear about um, and see how we could support you? And Amy, before we go, I just saw another question in the chat. Oh, yeah. uh, is you. it acceptable to critique specific candidates? I hear that in congregations frequently. Um, it's, well, again, you know, the closer the election year is, it, it's not a good practice in general. And it depends where and how it's happening. Is it happening from the pulpit? If it's happening at coffee hour and it's people expressing their opinions, that's part of any kind of discourse. If it's on the church sign, you know, that's, I would steer clear, you know, um, that would be a no. Um, you know, if it's in a sermon, I think that's very shaky ground. Um, uh, if it seems to be endorsing that person. Thank you. Yeah, I bet the rooms in the small groups, like three to four people each. So yeah, about eight minutes left. And I'll project the questions in the breakout rooms as well. Welcome back. Everyone, I'd just love to go around and see if there's um, some, any report outs from the groups that uh, could uh, enlighten or enliven uh, or encourage um, all of us in what we may see as some next steps. Um, uh, thanks, Catherine. I think we're done at three sharp, aren't we? Okay, um, so group one. Any, do anyone remember your group numbers? Yeah, they may not know their group numbers. Okay. <laughs> I would right. say just, yeah, so whoever just, wants to speak up. <laughs> let's just popcorn it, yep. <laughs> oh, I see John Otto's hand lifted. Uh, we talked about uh, voter registration. Leonard talked about how he is doing that. It sounds fairly effective in his community. One of my concerns is that I feel that a lot of us are very critical of Christian nationalism. And when you criticize Christian nationalism, you're perceived as criticizing MAGA, and which of course then people say, well, you're criticizing the Republican Party. I, I assume that's legitimate, but I assume it's a little bit edgy for a lot of people who take that issue on. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we actually talked more about post-election situations um, as opposed to leading up. Um, I'm a campus pastor in addition to being a vicar here at church, and um, I deal with aftermath. I think I said that politically correctly. I deal with aftermath. And we're worried about riots mm -hmm. and, vi and more violence. As, as are many, um, and I, I know that there's different kinds of planning going on in different communities. I know there's also planning in the ELCA, you know, about how to do that, but until it hits, I think a lot of people haven't thought about how they might respond. Do you have any tips, uh, you know, having been on campuses, uh, you know, that I think maybe have more experience than congregations on de-escalation? I'm, maybe that's a big assumption. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, mm. I'm six feet tall, so no one's really going to <laughs> say anything to me. I mm mean, -hmm. um, if I say something, they pretty much calm down. Um, uh, wearing a collar sometimes helps. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't because you're a woman in a collar and some people don't like that. Um, but sometimes you are viewed as a voice of reason um, and that, that kind of helps or at least a safe space. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's all you can offer. And I did have a one um, fun adventure when a riot occurred and the rioters actually left me alone because I was wearing a collar. Mm -hmm. So... That, that's all I've got. Just, just 
do what you can. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a variety of ways that people are preparing for that possibility. Um, some is working just on online behavior conversations, as well as um, we do have some pieces around, you know, I, identifying misinformation. What do you do? <laughs> you know, don't pass it on. But you know, how how to you know do that in the online space, which is its own generator, right? Of um, uh, discourse and and violence and um, misinformation. You know, then there's some of the active bystanders, you know, training and how you can, you know, physically uh, help to de to de-escalate a situation. And I think different people are maybe called to different things, but it's certainly that awareness is there. Um, you know, and then on Christian nationalism, I mean, there's more and more resources, you know, plenty of books. But I think you're absolutely right that there's a lot of good analysis, the history, the development, um, but um, how to speak about it in ways that those who may um, not be as clear about it, you know, or what it is. I, I, I think that's something, a muscle we need to develop uh, better is about how to have those uh, early conversations. Um, Episcopal Church has an, in, an interesting collection of, of um, some some articles and thought pieces on um, uh, de-radicalization. Um, and it's so in congregations, you know, identifying what are some of the early marks of someone who's who may be starting to be radicalized um, in, in particular ways and opening the door. It's it's I think they have a lot of links to some other organizations that really specialize in this. But that is one approach, um, you know, so how, how do you notice some of those early warning signs? Time for maybe one more share. So I do see in the chat, is it acceptable to critique specific candidates? Um, someone brought that up uh, before everyone was back, uh, Naomi, and, um, I, you know, I, I was saying, well, certainly not on the church sign, you know, or in, you know, public face, you know, the church's Facebook page, um, conversation at coffee hour, that's two individuals expressing their opinion. The pastor from the pulpit, no. Um, and not only, not just for the, the IRS, you know, protecting your tax exempt status, but also what is, congr what, what's needed in congregations, the congregational leadership um, and the potential to, cre to create the best possible environment where people can still connect, um, converse, uh, and, and figure this out together instead of retreating into deeper polarization. It, there's, it's a tightrope, you know, it's a zigzag. It's, um, th there's general guidelines. Um, everyone has to feel their way on it. It's better not to do it alone, but to then um, have colleagues for consultation and, and to reflect about these things. Cause they're, they're hard. These are hard. Karen. Um, may I draw, may I share with everybody in the chat, the uh, events that you're going to be doing with our, okay. our colleagues in the uh, lower West sure. Michigan Synod. Um, if anyone's interested, it's a Tuesday night series of um uh, available to all, um, coordinated by a different synod, and Amy's going to, our, our, our pastor Amy's going to be uh, leading that, and I'm really looking forward to it. It should be some uh, more in-depth discussion. Thank you, Karen. And I um, notice we're close on time, so yeah, thank you, Amy, very much for this today. Everything Karen has included in the chat, as well as some other things we'll include with the recording today, and I'll have that up by tomorrow. Uh, join us next week as we start a new thing on the first Wednesdays of each month. We're calling it Creative, Creating Beloved Community, Healing Together. So as you leave here today, please remember that you are seen, you are valued, and you are loved. We'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>